Good morning. Happy Monday. Hope you all had a good weekend. I hope your families are safe and healthy. Uh, I hope friends are safe and healthy. I hope you're getting outside and getting fresh air every day. Um, I miss seeing you. I miss seeing you in class. I miss seeing you at school. Um, but I'm so impressed with the work you guys are doing to keep your education going while we're in remote learning week four. Um, so congratulations on your hard work. Uh, yeah, we're gonna keep on keeping on. Staying healthy, staying strong. Um, the big news from the weekend is that the college board announced what their AP exam was going to be. They surprised everyone by telling us it was going to be a DBQ. We were expecting short answer or LAQ, but it's going to be a DBQ. Uh, I think that is great in a lot of ways because you guys have had a ton of experience uh, doing DBQ practice. You have done a lot of inquiry lessons. Um, and we're going to take some time uh, later this week to really look at that rubric closely. Uh, it's a modified rubric. It's going to be five documents, not seven documents. Uh, and there's some interesting ways you can get points now um, that I think will work in your advantage. Um, some of the stuff is the same as it always is, like context and thesis, but some of it is a little bit different just in how they score it. Um, but it should be something you guys are all familiar with. and. Uh, yeah, I think you're going to do well. I think you're going to do well. We, we're going to do a lot of DBQ practice between now and May 21st. So we also have a date for our AP exam. The date is May 21st. Put it in your calendars. May 21st is when you guys will take the AP World History exam. So we know what we're working towards. Um, and we got about five weeks minus spring break to get there. It's going to be great. Um, uh, I want to, oh yeah, so today's our last day on Schoology as well. Tomorrow we're shifting to Google Classroom. It's going to throw us for, you know, a few loops. I'm sure it will take a, a little bit to get used to that platform since we took a little while to get used to Schoology, uh, but hopefully we won't have any issues with uh, tech or anything like that crashing with Google Classroom. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be patient with each other as we figure that out. Um, I think everyone's in enrolled in my Google Classroom. I got a lot of help from uh, Mr. O'Leary setting that up, so I want to thank him. Uh, if you guys can shoot him a message and say, hey, thanks for helping Dr. Kerr out, I'd appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be in Google Classroom tomorrow and see how it goes. Okay, last day in school, G. Um, today we're going to look at a, uh, uh, kind of a review. It's kind of a review lecture, um, that captures everything we've talked about, um, over the last, uh, week or so. Um, and... Uh, I just want to start with uh, responding to some data, giving you guys some uh, feedback. Um, you guys wrote a couple of thesis context statements and thesis statements uh, in your exit tickets last week. And I wanted to go over a couple of examples. Uh, this is batch feedback that I think will help a lot of you. Um, but take a look at this context and thesis. And I want you to just to decide if this earns a context point and if it earns a thesis point. So read it carefully, I'll read it out loud, and then uh, think about it. Does it earn a context point? Does it earn a thesis point? During the, early, that, during the modern era, should be early modern era, uh, new technology and new crops and domesticated animals were introduced in both the Eastern and Western Hemisphere. The Clement Exchange was a biological transfer between the Old World and the New World that affected people in the Americas by the spread of disease brought into the New World by Europeans that killed millions of Americans. Um, and the prompt was, again, how did, it, how did the Clement Exchange affect the Americas? Um, so do you think that earns a thesis point? Do you think it earns a con context 
point. Take a second to think about that. Okay, what do you think? So earn a thesis point. Let's start with the thesis. Yeah, I agree. Clear thesis, the Columbian Exchange brought diseases to the New World by Europeans that killed many Americans, Native Americans. Definitely earns a thesis point. Does it earn a contact point? Does it tell the story before the Columbian Exchange started? Here's the problem. Um, it defines the Columbian Exchange, which is excellent. You definitely want to define the Columbian Exchange or define the Atlantic system or define uh, globalization or whatever your, your, the, the topic is. It's always great to mention that topic, define that topic. Um, but the context is really about setting the stage of the story, telling what happened before that leads to the Columbian Exchange. Uh, and if you said you don't think this earns a context point, I think I agree with you. I don't think it earns a context point either. It's got a great definition of the Columbian Exchange here, but it doesn't earn a context point. Okay, how about this one? In the early modern era, Christopher Columbus was sent out to find a direct route to Asia in order to get Asian luxury goods and be involved in direct trade. However, Columbus landed in the Americas, causing European imperial expansion and the biological transfer we know is the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is the transfer of plants, animals, and diseases between the Old World and the New World. Between 1450 and 1750, the Columbian Exchange led to a significant decrease in the American population because of the spread of diseases and also led to a major shift in labor systems. Does it earn a thesis point? Does it earn a context point? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It earns both, right? The thesis is the same. Diseases led to population decrease. Uh, but the context is there. It's telling what happened that leads to the climate exchange. Like Christopher Columbus, this is this the green here is the context. The yellow is the same that was in both. It was in both. Um, but the green that Columbus wanted to set out to find a direct route to Asia in order to get Asian luxury goods. Uh, direct trade with Asia. That's setting up the story of why the Columbian Exchange happens. So that's a beautiful example of a context sentence, a uh, couple of context sentences that would earn the context point. Um, so thank you to my fourth period students. Uh, I pulled this from fourth period, uh, volunteers. Um, both were great examples, both are in a thesis point, which I'm really pumped about. Uh, and that, that first example just needed a little bit more about what happened to lead to the Columbian Exchange or in the context point. Um, okay, today's lecture is kind of a review lecture. We're looking at the world in 1600. We're taking a snapshot as if we're flying in an airplane above the planet and we're flying around and we're looking down at all the different parts of the world in the year 1600, trying to think about what's happening. Uh, and then we're going to take this review lecture into uh, the kind of main focus of the lecture, which is the emergence of the first global trade network, first global trade network in the world. Um, so what's happening in the world in 1600? Can you explain to someone in your family all of the empires that exist in 1600? Do you know what empires are in power? Do you know who's controlling what regions of the planet? Uh, do you know what methods those empires are using to control those different regions of the planet? Um, I hope this is something that you can kind of capture your head around and that you could lead me on this tour, so to speak, that you could be my tour guide. Uh, that's where I want you to be, uh, to be ready for the AP exam that you could give me a tour of the world in 1600. Um, so as you think about that and take notes, think about uh, um, where, what you would say if you gave me a tour of the world in 1600, uh, see if it matches with my tour of the world in 1600. So I want to start with a big thing about the Columbian Exchange. So we talked about the impacts, the major impacts of the Columbian Exchange a population decrease in the Americas, population due to disease coming from the old world, those crowd diseases, 
the diseases that are created when animals and humans live in close quarters with each other. COVID is another example of that, a virus that is bred in animals and then jumps to humans. This is how most of the most significant diseases in the world get started. Uh, the interaction between humans and animals with whom they live close. Uh, so the diseases wipe out many Native Americans, but populations go up in Africa and Europe and Asia because of what? Correct, the potatoes, corn, sweet potatoes, cassava, all those old world crops that move into the new, uh, those, excuse me, those new world crops that move into the old world. Um, so the Columbia Exchange is in full effect in 1600, but historians have also noticed that there's something called the Little Ice Age is starting to take place. The Little Ice Age is a general cooling of the planet, uh, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, especially in Europe, the Little Ice Age leads to uh, problems. It leads to famine. It's, uh, it's decades and decades of longer, colder winters, uh, wetter, colder summers. Uh, and some historians have kind of projected that this little ice age, you can see here that temperatures dropped in the 1400s to 1600s. Some scientists, uh, or some scientists slash historians have proposed that this may have something to do with the Columbian Exchange. We had a lesson on this that some of you mentioned actually in your uh, writing. Um, Sarah Ahmed, I think you might have mentioned this, uh, but uh, the impacts of the Little Ice Age in northern climes were famine, disease, war. Uh, it leads to new cultural activities like ice skating, uh, which we can see in this image. Um, but we also read a theory that the Little Ice Age may have led, may have been a result of the Columbia Exchange because Native Americans were very good agroforesters. They burned down forests in order to um, farm, just like a lot of other groups do. Uh, they, they managed forests to create farmland, and when the Native Americans died off because of diseases, those forests came back. And so those forests that had been burned down every year seasonally by Native Americans in North America created a lot of carbon dioxide that kept the planet warm. And when the forests no longer were being burned by Native Americans because they died because of old world diseases, the forest came back, they pulled carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, put oxygen back in, and that may have uh, lowered the temperature of the planet. Um, so maybe a lesson we can take there if we want to stop global warming is just to plant a lot of trees. Um, could help. Okay, so climate exchange is happening. Uh, what else is happening? Well, the gunpowder empires, Ottoman, Safavid, Mughal empires, the Russians, they're all kind of at their peak right now. So they're spreading, they're using their gunpowder weapons to expand, they're establishing different kinds of rule. Some of them are religious, religiously tolerant. Uh, the Ottomans and the Mughals are conquering Christians and Hindus respectively, and they're letting them stay, uh, keep their religions, uh, they're collecting tax and tribute from them, but generally both of those empires are tolerant to other religions. The Russians, on the other hand, are conquering all of Siberia. They're forcing the Siberians to convert to Christianity. They're encouraging conversion. Spanish are conquering Latin America, encouraging conversion. Um, currency is being used. So we've, we've moved by 1600, we've moved beyond just the barter system. And so there's starting to be currency, banknotes, coins, uh, letters of credit and debit are being ex exchanged between empires, between traders within empires. So there's starting to be this flow of money and credit uh, along with the flow of goods. Um, we spent a lot of time last, last week thinking about Spain. So Spain in period three is a very weak kingdom. It's essentially conquered by who? This map shows us an empire that conquered most of Spain. I hope you remember, it's the Umayyads. They create Al-Andalus, uh, the kingdom in Europe, the Islamic 
caliph of Europe. Um, and, but by period four, the Spanish are responding to the uh, conquest of the Iberian Peninsula by Muslim Umayyads with a reconquista. So they conquer back the Iberian Peninsula and then because Columbus is the one who sails for Spain and arrives in the Americas, these conquistadors arrive in the Americas, Hernan Cortez conquers the Aztec, Pizarro conquers the Inca, and they're helped along by the great dying, uh, the diseases that wipe out the Native Americans that make it much easier for the Spanish to conquer. But when the Spanish arrive in the New World, uh, they quickly discover that in South America and Mexico both, there are incredibly lucrative silver mines. The most famous of those mines is the Potosi mine in Bolivia. It's located by the Spanish in the 1450s. The Incas knew about it forever, but uh, the Spanish identify it in the 1450s. Um, and the Spanish set up two different kinds of uh, coerced labor systems. They borrow the Mita system from the Inca. The Inca used the Mita system to build the road networks that they used, uh, but it wasn't a punishment system. It was a labor tax. It was where people did their civic duty to help build the roads, and then they went back to their houses and back to their families. Uh, Spanish corrupt that Mita system into something much more coercive, much more violent, uh, and they use it to start mining Potosí. Spanish are also using the encomienda system where they control Native American farmland uh, and they take that farmland from Native Americans, force them to convert to Catholicism and essentially force them to produce agricultural goods for Spanish benefit. Um, after the Spanish discover this silver in the Americas, uh, they establish something known as the Quinto, the fifth. This is a 20% tax that the Spanish lords get on all of the silver that comes out of the Americas. They use this silver to build incredible palaces, like this palace. This is the Spanish royal palace outside of Madrid. They use the silver to enrich their families. They use the silver to build one of the largest navies in the world, the Spanish Armada, that's defeated by the British. Uh, in 1588, kind of stops Spain from becoming a global superpower. Um, but the Spanish fifth is something that you need to know. It's the, again, the tax that the Spanish take, that the Spanish king gets, the Spanish royal family gets. One fifth of all the silver that comes out of the Americas goes to the Spanish king. Um, the two kings that you need to know about are uh, Carlos V. He's the one who's kind of in charge when the conquistadors are conquering and then his son, Philip II. Philip II is also for whom the Philippines are named after. The Philippines are called Philippines because they're named after Philip II. Um, so this is a Spanish colony established in Southeast Asia. Um, so those are the two kings in power. Um, but at the same time that Spain is expanding, uh, the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company and the Portuguese are all starting to take over the Indian Ocean trade. Uh, we spent time talking about this. They all are joint stock companies. Well, the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company both use this idea of a joint stock company to reduce the risk. The Portuguese are the first to arrive in the Indian Ocean. They bring this idea of increased violence, cannons on their ships, cannons on forts, and they disrupt a peaceful free trade zone and make it, they try to create a monopoly. Uh, the Portuguese make a lot of money in the carry trade, just transporting goods back and forth in the Indian Ocean between the different regions of the Indian Ocean. Um, and then the Dutch and the British arrive, they kind of displace the Portuguese and they're all seeking luxury goods from China, luxury goods from Southeast Asia. Um, and I think you guys have a good sense of what these luxury goods are. We've covered it again and again. Um, but these questions I think are great to ask yourself. What are the goods that Europeans want from China? 
Um, pause the video for a second, think about that. And if you were saying uh, porcelain, silk, spices, you're absolutely on the right track. Those are the main things. Porcelain, silk, and spices are the most important luxury goods. What's China, what does China want from Europe in exchange for those goods? They want very little actually. All that China really wants is gold and silver. So this creates something known as a trade imbalance for Europeans. They are losing all of their hard currency, gold and silver, in exchange for luxury goods. Currency like gold and silver can be the backbone for the whole economy, for farmers, for laborers, for everybody sees value in gold and silver in Europe. Not everyone gets the value of the luxury goods. Those are for the wealthy elite. So Europe is losing a lot of gold and silver in exchange for luxury goods from China. Benefits China kind of hurts Europe economically. Um, the last thing to remember about uh, the 1600s is that the Ming Dynasty, which conquered the Mongols, removed the Mongols from power, um, is thriving. The Ming Dynasty captures this idea of being the Middle Kingdom about as well as any of the Chinese dynasties. Uh, they really think, rightly, that they are the center of the universe, um, that they have everything that they could want in the world, that the rest of the world has nothing to offer them. The rest of the world, in fact, is nothing more than uncivilized barbarians, whereas the Chinese of the Ming Dynasty are the most civilized, most educated, most articulate, uh, advanced civilization in the world. And in many ways, they're probably right. Um, in 1421, uh, this is 70 years before Columbus set sail, uh, Zheng He was sent out by the Ming Emperor uh, to explore the Indian Ocean. He sailed all around the Indian Ocean. He sailed all down the coast of Africa. And he brought back tribute to the king, uh, sorry, to the emperor of China from all of his journeys. Uh, he easily could have sailed across the Pacific and arrived in the Americas, you know, 50 years before Columbus did. Um, but his explorations convinced the Ming that they were right, that the, the Middle Kingdom, they were the Middle Kingdom, that the rest of the world had nothing really to offer uh, that would make life any better for them. Uh, so they shut down Zheng He's uh, Explore, ex, exploration. They uh, dismantled his ships. Uh, they ended the whole project of exploration um, because they realized that they just didn't think they needed anything else from the rest of the world. They were the middle kingdom and that was good enough. Uh, in many ways, they were probably right. Um, but it also meant that they weren't trading a whole lot. So this Ming isolation meant that they had very strict control on trade with Europe and with the rest of the world. The other thing the Ming did around 1600 is they developed this thing called the single whip system. Uh, we learned about the single whip system where they switched from rice being the primary form of payment to silver. So switching from rice being used as payment to silver. Uh, rice is a great thing to be paid in because it's something you can use. And if you have rice, you know you can feed yourself and your family. Uh, so if you and you can sell it and you can trade it um, but it is perishable so if your rice stock gets uh well it's heavy also it's perishable it could be contaminated by uh diseased animals or it could get flooded or anything like that so china thought it would be helpful to switch to a monetary tax system where they started taxing farmers and laborers and silver the problem is they didn't have enough silver in china to switch to this system. And it creates economic hardship, especially for the poor farmers um, who just don't have enough silver. They had rice, they could pay their taxes in rice, but they can't pay their taxes in silver. So the discovery of silver in Spain, uh, sorry, in, in, in Bolivia, that the Spanish take control of, starts to have global implications. Um, and we spent actually a whole week thinking about the global silver trade in quarter two. We, start, we started thinking about 
we're right at the end of quarter one, I guess. We started thinking about how uh, this introduction of millions of dollars worth of silver from Latin America reshaped the global economy. Uh, and we looked at this question, what were the social and economic impacts of the Spanish discovery of silver in the Americas? So how did it, the discovery of silver in the Americas impact the rest of the world? Um, you can pause this, this is in your notebook. Um, uh, so you, we've already done this lesson, this is just review, but we talked about how uh, the discovery of silver created the first global currency ever. This is truly a world kind of changing moment where a single currency known as the piece of eight, the Spanish piece of eight, peso de ocho, could be used to buy goods or services basically anywhere in the world. It was recognized everywhere. Uh, first time in world history that there's a global currency that everywhere in the world thinks, hey, yeah, I recognize that. That's worth something to me. Um, the Spanish grew incredibly wealthy. The Spanish used their money to fight wars against rivals throughout Europe. The Spanish used that money to establish a colony in the, Philippine, in the South Pacific known as the Philippines. They want this colony so that they can get direct exchange with China. Um, the discovery of silver actually leads to financial chaos in China because they had a carefully controlled economy and all of a sudden silver is pouring into their economy and it leads to inflation. Um, but at the same time, the Ming Dynasty comes out of isolation. They start trading much more with Europe, with the Spanish, with the Dutch, with the British, uh, with all the Europeans who now have direct maritime routes to China. Um, and the social impacts are mostly on the American side. What's happening to the Native Americans who are forced to work in these silver mines? Uh, it was a death sentence. If you were conscripted to work in the silver mine, you were going to die. Um, there are stories of women who would, uh, mothers who would chop off their children's arms or chop off their leg in order to prevent them from being conscripted to work in the mines because they figured I'd rather have a son without an arm than a son who dies in the mines. And uh, the, the silver mining was brutal work. The Spanish were brutal masters of the workers. Um, people got sick from pneumonia. People got sick from mercury poisoning. After a lot of Native Americans died in the mines. The Spanish start bringing in African slaves to work in the mines. Um, so the working conditions and the life of those conscripted to work in mines was miserable. That's the main social impact. Um, the key economic impact, again, is just this idea that we see the first global trade network, the first global currency, uh, and for the first time, really, in the history of the world, we can say everything was economically connected. What happened in the Americas had an impact on what happened in Europe, which had it also had an impact on what happened in Asia. Um, so it's a remarkable moment in time. Um, and the social impacts were really uh, the transformation of labor conditions in the Americas. and and. The, this introduces the idea that the Americas are a place to be exploited by Europeans. Europeans start to see the Americas as a land of exploitation. We can exploit their silver. Eventually, they're going to realize that they can start growing cash crops, and we can also exploit labor, enslaved humans to produce money. So the Americas become a land where Europeans want to extract and exploit the wealth of the land for their benefit. Um, here's a great map of the Spanish galleons. This is the red marker, shows you everywhere that the Spanish galleons were sailing. And the map captures the main idea of the lecture that once the Spanish discover silver in the Americas, silver becomes the first global trade network and these ships, the galleons, become the first global, they're like 
the airplanes of today. They are traveling literally everywhere. They're going up to Russia. They're going across the Americas. They're going across the Pacific. They're going around the Horn of Africa. Uh, the Spanish galleons are sailing everywhere, bringing that silver everywhere. Um, so that's what I got today. Uh, work carefully in the exit ticket. It's three short answers. Make sure you use the lecture today to answer them in complete sentences with lots of evidence to support. See you all tomorrow in Google Classroom. So long, Schoology. We'll miss you.